Billy here. Sunday. Got off work. I'm gonna do the video. This one I'm playing with uh, ideas of uh, music. How music inculates a set of symbols. How music sets a tone, sets a mood. And it's cultural. What you get from different types of music means something different to you than it would to somebody from another culture. Seems obvious, right? It's not that universal in what it conveys, I think. Uh, I believe people th from other cultures, uh, like East Asians, Japanese for instance, they, they, they appreciate Western music. Uh, Bach, <laughs> Beethoven, and uh, the classics. And yet they also think Old MacDonald had a farm and Mary had a little lamb and London Bridge is falling down. They're, they're all the same. They're all in the same category. They're, they're great pieces of music and they don't make a distinction between them. They don't make a distinction between some being uh, highbrow and some being for children or even insipid. The reason I know this is because uh, the machines in the factory where I work, rather than have these ugly buzzers and bells and alarms when something goes wrong, they have an electronic, a digital kalalope is what it sounds like. It plays a digital tune. And they play different tunes for different music. Sometimes they play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Sometimes they play Flurry These or uh, some other piece of classical music, or green sleeves. And it, 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 there's no telling what they're going to play. I like classical music. I don't like it banged about repetitively on an electronic cabalope all day while I'm working uh, 10 meters from it, and nobody shuts it off. Because <clears throat> they go off if the air pressure dips down a little bit, all kinds of real sensitive things, because they're always going off and all over the factory. you got all these stupid tunes playing. If nobody's attending that machine, it'll just play in a loop over and over and over again all day long. So this is hell. And then Sunday, people bring in their boom boxes. Yeah, only on Sunday. And people have huge, expensive, elaborate boom boxes, and they set them up, and they're working right next to it, but they have to have it blasting for a whole area, so they're assuming everybody likes their music. And over here at this machine, you've got somebody playing uh, New Country. Ugh. And then there's always somebody playing classic rock, the cliche songs, the ones that you turn into a classic rock radio station and listen to it for one hour and hear all of them about six times each because they got a playlist about half a page long. And they only play the songs they own the rights to. And they're the same ones that are used in advertisements. <laughs> and then you have your hip hop, and uh, you have your your girly music. I don't know what to call it. Or they're like they're doing voice exercises and trying to sound like Whitney Houston doing voice exercises. Orgasmic singing. I don't much care for any of it. To tell you the truth, I think people should be polite and wear earbuds and let others be alone with their thoughts. But some people can't stand their own thoughts, so they have to fill their head with noise. But the music means different things to different people, how they grew up, their personalities. And you can change things up. That's what I was thinking about. You take a, a song that is... Uh, Songs carry messages. What, what, what? In the, in the late seventies and early eighties, they had all these songs that were just pushing, like advertisements, pushing unbridled passion, unbridled mindless lust. It, it's there's a certain pride to it. Look at Mick Jagger strutting around. I'm so hot for you. I'm so hot for you. Okay. All right, Mac. You made your millions. Let's change it up a little bit. Let's take those lyrics and put them in like a, a 19th century evangelical hymn. <laughs> it's, it's fun. 
I'm so hot for you, I'm so hot for you, I'm so hot for her and she's so cold. I'm so hot for her, I'm on fire for her, I'm so hot for her and she's so cold. I'm the burning bush, I'm the burning fire, I'm the bleeding volcano. I'm so hot for her, I'm so hot for her, I'm so hot for her, and she's so cold. So, does that change things up a bit? It sets a different tone? Does it change the meaning? I think it's interesting, because these songs, a lot of them are put together on purpose. It's not organic. It's not some songwriter struggling to make a buck writes a beautiful song and he's discovered and goes on the radio. You and I both know that's not how it happens. There are people that want to influence culture. They want to move it a certain way. They want to address certain issues and correct them in their mind. And uh, mass media was discovered in that they rode the waves of chaos. Those guys were just shooting the tubes on this stuff. I think a lot of it started with Counter Intel Pro, where they had to slander the anti-war movement. And that's where rock and roll really got psychedelicized. And I think they were probably surprised at the, at the popularity of it, because it was just this wild music to go with the beatniks and hippies, and they pushed them as being the anti-war movement. Instead of these nice, articulate, college-educated people that had points, and were organizing politically and actually were effective at keeping us out of Vietnam. Oh yeah, the focus of the media, they had to have something so they focus on, you know, Abby Hoffman and Wavy Gravy and all these people that openly advocate communism and drugs and uh, free love. And it created a mass marketing sensation. There's big money in it. The young generation flooded into it, and they just amped it up, and they profited off of it. That's why there's so many uh, military intelligence people in the rock and roll business. They were pleasantly surprised, and they put their family members in things, you know, and made them rock stars, because they knew the publishers, they had the strings. Jim Hendrix, uh, John Phillips, David Crosby. You think Bing Crosby wasn't made? Yeah, he was. He, he worked with the military. Oh, Joe Morrison? Yeah. His dad pretty much is solely responsible for getting us into Vietnam. Well, he did his mission. If he hadn't done it, somebody else would have. Jimmy! <laughs> Jimmy, get down here, Jimmy! <laughs> yes, father? You gonna be rock and roll star, boy? Get down here, I got a job for you. Make millions. That's how it happened. And the beat, the frequency, the cadence, all that stuff was very carefully gone over. They, they, they did studies on that. You could look up the papers that have been released from Langley and uh, oh, the British intelligence uh, research people, <laughs> behavioral research. Uh, I forget the name of it. It'll come to me after the video's over. If I think of it, I'll tell you. But, uh... They put a lot of work into that influencing. Into that mass media influence. And they steered a generation. The generation gap. The war between the sexes. We're the young generation and we got something to say. Feminism. Get them women out in the workforce. Break up families. Ann Murray. And before her, there were the, the, the Yentas of rock. They all came from New York. And they all, I think they all hung out together. They, I think they, were, they went to this, a lot of the same uh, neighborhoods and the same schools. Uh, and they were all of a particular certain tribe. Except Melanie. She just, she was from uh, Western Ukraine, which is pretty much the same thing. Uh, rest of them are totally uh, Brooklyn, Queens. A lot of them went to acting school. There's Melissa Manchester. 
who's I I think I, I read now I read somewhere that her real name wasn't Melissa Manchester. She was a nice Jewish girl. But then I I looked it up because I didn't remember what her real name was, and I was curious. And now it's all changed. Oh, the whole family's Manchester. Yeah, she was born from by Mr. and Mrs. Manchester. I'm pretty sure I'm not misremembering that thing. There's, it's amazing when you go to actors and actresses and rock stars, especially in groups. Their, I know Wikipedia changes, but then their websites and the fan sites, they all change too. They change the facts and details and screw them around. And they even change out who's who in the pictures. It's amazing. They go back and scrub stuff and they rearrange it to their own liking. I don't know if the publishers and the people that own the brand are making adjustments. You know, this stuff is meticulously groomed in manicure. Now, these little spats they have, that's just to get them in the news, sell more records. I have very little doubt that some of them that supposedly died didn't really die. They just wanted to retire and are tired of it. And you can get a last boost on the sales if you, something happens to you. All you got to do is make a press release. Nobody questions it. Nobody's going to find out. If they do, they just get discredited. It's a crazy conspiracy nut. Some people say Rush Limbaugh is Jim Morrison. <laughs> that's funny. I don't believe that. But he did look a lot like him. And that's just funny. Oh, some, some humor there. But these Yentas all kind of circle around Carly Simon. And she she went to uh, what, the Juilliard School. And her father, her father, Richard Simon... He put the Simon and Simon and Schuster. Did you know that? The world's biggest publishing house. So I'm sure she got by on nothing but her own talent. Hmm. And Melanie. Okay, Woodstock. You think Woodstock wasn't organized by, you know, the powers of be? Why wouldn't it be? It was. It was. It was. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe they just globbed onto it. But after Woodstock, it was re imagined as some place where young people were going to speak truth to power and it changed the world <laughs> like it like they're all some sort of saints and martyrs and Melanie wrote a song and it got real popular a couple of years after Woodstock that she claims was inspired by her being at Woodstock candles in the rain yeah really some came to sing, some came to pray, some came to drive the dark away. Really? People went to Woodstock to pray? I know people that went to Woodstock, and I've seen a lot of Woodstock footage and read a lot of things, but it looks to me like they went there to get really ripped and drunk and make beasts of themselves and maybe run around naked and root in the mud. But they're martyrs and they're saints because that's what it's reimagined as now. They were young people being heard holding candles in the rain. You know the military industrial complex loves that shit. In the early 60s, you had a serious, well-tuned, well-oiled political anti-war movement of articulate people that meant business and were well-liked by the voters. And 10 years later, you have, you have freaking hippies holding candles in the rain. Well, that's certainly going to be effective. Let your white birds smile up at those that stand and frown. Yeah, you're going to hold your little white bird up and smiling at the frowny faces that start wars. It's become insipid, and insipid equals ineffective. They really smeared the anti war movement. Robert F. Kennedy is replaced by Wavy Gravy. You know, trying to levitate the Pentagon, it became a big freaking joke and a big freaking circus. That's how they roll. It's entertaining, though, isn't it? Isn't it entertaining? But, you know, if you lost people and everything, that's just the price you got to pay to be entertained. It's freaking funny, isn't it? <laughs> Candles in the rain. <laughs> oh, she's a groovy little hippie. Oh, no, she's not a hippie chick, and she's not a beatnik. She's a nice girl. And she got that hit with... Uh, roller skate. I saw an interview with her. Oh, those people just have dirty minds. There's no double meetings. <laughs> How stupid do you think we are? Do 
Jeez, I was going somewhere with this. Music is like the pastry and the sugar that carries something in it. What's it carrying? Poison in some cases. Remember soft rock? I used to call it wuss rock. I didn't like it very much, but it was background noise. It didn't bother me. I, I remember the songs. I, I, oh, that's pretty nice tunes. If you want to be a mellow fellow. Bread. Remember bread? And I've heard that song a gazillion times because I grew up in the 70s. Diary. You don't notice the words. When that music is hypnotic, the words go in, but you don't notice them. A sweet little song some guy wrote about his wife. He found her diary, and she's writing about him. And he didn't know she felt that way. She never said it, you know. I never even noticed until I got away from music because I, I started to really intensely dislike classic rock, mainly because it's everywhere. The same ten songs are played everywhere at Infinum. And they're not really very good ones either. And they carry a cadence that uh, the message of the, the music's grammar is like uh, pride. Especially when you get to metal, it's like, you know, the devil told me if I kill my parents and burn their house down, then I'll be a rock god and the girls will worship me and I'll be a millionaire. And I just did it. Yeah, yeah, man. And he starts strutting like Mick Jagger. That's what it reminds me of, just a joke. These people are pathetic. I don't like it much. And I'm working blue collar, right? I'm working in plants and shutdowns and all the different trades got their big boom boxes going. I'm the, uh, I'm the jerk that comes around and asks them to turn it down. I really don't want to hear that at 90 decibels. You're right here next to it. Can you turn it down? And then they will get offended. Oh, I'll just turn it off then. Hey, that'd be even better. <laughs> I'm supposed to go, no, no, a passive, full grown ass adult man in the blue taller world that are just such passive aggressive little babies. And you got your rap over here, and you got your classic rock over here, and you got your new country over here. Gosh, it just drives me mad. And they leave to go to lunch, they leave it blasting. I have taken the cords off of them and hidden them at lunchtime. I think they know I did it, but they're afraid to say anything. I got to where I just didn't want to hear anything. You turn on the radio and these goofy, stupid idiots are talking, Oh, this is a fact, and they tell you bullshit that can't possibly be true, but oh, wow, that's really true. And then they play the same ten songs over and again. I got away from it. I didn't listen to anything. I studied some, I studied me some Bach and Beethoven and learned all I could about it. And there's something there I like. But then, if you hear some, and you will, incidentally, it's totally different. It's like being away from television for a long time. You don't watch television for years, and then you see one. You go to visit a friend, he's got the TV on, and you go, I can't believe anybody can stand this shit. I want to throw a brick at it. And I, 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 I piss people off. says, how can you stand there and watch this? They don't see it. I do. I've been away from it. Same thing happens with the music. If you've been away from it and you, and you accidentally get some thrown on you, they spill some on you. I'm bored. I'm taking a long trip. I'm driving. I'm tuning through the radio. And I will stop on some, you know, pop standards or something, you know, so I hadn't heard since I was a kid. Bread was playing Diary. And the first time I actually heard the words, that song is evil. The dude finds that his diary is his wife, and she th he thinks she's talking about him, and then finally he figures out, oh no, she's talking about some other dude. <laughs> and then, oh, oh, I just want you to be happy, go with him, and I bless you, and be happy. That's, that's the song. It's the old free love thing. It's the old, you know, possession is patriarchal, and it's only done by cavemen. We advance people. We let people go if we love them. And if they don't come back, that wasn't meant to be. The freaking married. He did that to his wife. She's in error and needs to be corrected and saved from doing damage to herself. Doesn't say if they had kids or not. I don't suppose they did. But no, no, he blessed her to go off with this guy that she's writing a diary about. I never noticed that in that song. And I heard it a, a gazillion times.
till I got away from it and then I heard it and I heard it very clearly. And I, I hear other songs, the same thing. I hear the message that I didn't notice before. Anybody else got experience like that? It's like television. You see, you get to understand things and you stay away from it for a while. You quit eating those pastries and then next time one gets accidentally in your mouth somehow, you can taste that freaking poison in it. You notice it right off. Music is hypnotic and it has this cadence that carries its own symbolism. Evangelical hymns, all right, like I just did, only I did it with Mick Jagger's lyrics, which is silly, but it's still his name, Bill. It, it, it still evoked that, that feeling, didn't it? It wouldn't evoke that feeling to a Muslim. It wouldn't evoke that feeling to an East Asian. It is cultural. And you establish cultural uh, parameters and myths with music. What Anna Safka did, excuse me, Melanie, her real name is Anna Safka. What Melanie did was she secularized Woodstock. Woodstock was people that came to sing and pray and drive the darkness away by holding candles in the rain and having the white bird smile up the frowny face MIC. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Anna. You helped kill the anti war movement. That's what that was for. It's a lot of things that are inculcated into our society like that. And it's just entertainment, right? It's just entertainment. Okay, this is enough for this video. The next one I'm gonna do is gonna be killer, I hope. I have high hopes for it. I gotta do a lot of research and I gotta really get an angle on this. Uh, I'm good friends with uh, the librarian of the apocalypse. She doesn't have a website. She's actually the librarian of the apocalypse, the real thing. She's, she's rolling incognito. And uh, we were talking about the issues and education especially. She's a brilliant expert on that. And we were talking about the how people think we get left brain and right brain. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. The purveyors of the curriculum under instructions from the people that presume to own the planet are doing it for a reason. They want to separate left brain people from right brain people. We're going to address that next time because there's a reason for it. And you see it really hard, good and hard for you in the core curriculum and the stuff they're doing in the schools now. And even in these programs where they have, you know, the, uh, the schools for the gifted people, they're separating hard sciences and arts, liberal arts, and they've been doing that for a long time, but they're really separating them. We'll talk about that next time. Anyway, that's then, and this is now Uncle Bill, needs to go to sleep. Is that going to work? And, uh... Wow. Five or six hours to go to work. <laughs> anyway, Uncle Bill D's signing out. Hope you got something from this. Please leave comments. I may not be able to see them. I always get just a few comments and then some of them disappear, but give it a try. And you got my email address. Email me. Email me. <sighs> Uncle Bill D's signing out. <laughs>